Repertoire Podcast. Repertoire Podcast. What is up, folks? My guest today is Chef Christian Puglisi, known for many incredible projects across his career, but you probably know him from Relay in Copenhagen, as well as his fantastic published work, A Book of Ideas. I had the sincere pleasure of dining at Relay almost seven years ago, and I saw Chef Christian post on Instagram, because I've been following him for ages, that he's heading into a bit of a new chapter of mentoring and investing and advising. You should just do a little bit of research into what he's done with Relay and how he's opening it up to different chefs and creatives and talent to come through that space and use it as a way, springboard, launch, develop, all of that great stuff. And I thought it was a great moment in time to have him on the show just document what he's thinking about and any learnings that he's interested in passing on to you folks. If you enjoy this conversation, I recommend you queue up my interview with Vaughn Tan. That's V-A-U-G-H-N-T-A-N. And him and I, him and I had a conversation because he wrote an incredible book about culinary innovation called The Uncertainty Mindset. And I really enjoyed that interview. If you're interested in any of these concepts, I think you would. it's a natural next jumping off point. If at any point you'd like to pause, you want to check out Christian online or any of these specific linkable things that we discussed, please do check out the show notes, which are always available in the description of this podcast. But before we talk to Christian, I want to talk about Aura, which is a product that I wear on my finger, on my right-handed ring finger, and almost every single piece of content that you'll see me put out there because it's a sleep tracker that is providing tangible and actionable data for myself. I'm exercising five or six days a week these days, and it, it, it just helps me track my, it gives you a readiness score every day. It monitors your sleep. And Aura's kind of motto that they pitch is healthier you starts with better sleep and better sleep starts with Aura. And so what this does is it uses a combination of technological readings on your heart rate and your heart rate variability, your breathing patterns, uh, it tracks your temperature, and it basically takes all that data and cool, cataloging it is great, but how do you take action on it? And so if I've had a really hard day playing, you know, a three or four set tennis match and I don't sleep great, it's going to tell me in the morning, hey, you might need to take a little bit of recovery time today. And I think that's what's so cool about this. And so you get these personalized insights. It syncs with an app on your phone. uh, And if anybody's super data driven, this is just a fantastic product. I've had the generation two. They just came out with the generation three and I'm a huge fan. So if you want to check out Aura, you want to start to monitor your sleep, take that more seriously and you understand the benefits of a good night's sleep and a tool Call it like a little, you know, token that helps you remind yourself that you should prioritize your sleep. You can check out the link in the description, or you can visit justincana.com slash Aura. That's O-U-R-A. Also, if you want to check out a new set of tools that have been kind of catching my eye and just been recently launched by another channel partner, you should shop Corin. So Corin came out with a line called the Kaguya line, and it's a really beautiful, unpolished, folded set of knives and they have wah handles the one that i think i've got my eye on that i'm kind of you know creepily peeking around the tree and looking at is the the uh, kaguya wah kangata gyuto and it's the 9.4 inch it's got a k-tip it's really really cool looking i love that the bolster section is lighter and so it's kind of like this really nice clean uh, uh light handle going into a dark folded kind of exposed edge knife this is rocking a 64 hrc rating as well which is kind of insane and the other product that i'm i I bought these in japan and i gave them away when i was doing gear boxes way way back in the day it's from a brand called silky and corin actually has these as a featured product on the site right now they're silky kitchen scissors it's the same price as joyce jen's and they're just infinitely better and so if you're the type of person that has you know herb snipping projects or you know kind of like fruit leather cutting projects on your station silky kitchen scissors are available on corin and i just think it's such a no-brainer the folks that i sent these scissors to back in the day still dm me to this day and say these are my favorite scissors that i've been using and so if you want to check that out you can always shop justincana.com slash corin or just check the link in the description of this podcast that's all from me let's talk to christian so Christian, you've been in this industry for a really long time. What would Christian today tell Chef Christian coming off of being a sous chef 
at Noma and maybe it's changed nothing, but I'm curious how hindsight, how you look at that experience. Yeah. Like, and that's, a, I've been asked that question before and, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have reached some level sort of, of maturity by now. And I think that that is entirely based on having the experiences that I've had in the last soon to be like 12 years of, of being a restaurateur and I wouldn't have had those experiences if I didn't approach the situations that were, I was confronted with, with sometimes lack of experience and sometimes being naive or something like this. No. So I, I think it's, you know, I wouldn't change anything that I've done. You know, I've learned many things and I also realized that some of the fuck ups that you do, the mistakes that you make are really what makes you so yeah, I, I wouldn't really, I would just give myself a good luck and pat the shoulder <laughs> and but get it on, you know, even maybe something else to, to prioritize, or even if it's cause you, as I'm sure, you know, like there, there, there's, as I shared with you, there's a lot of folks listening who are coming off of line cook experiences, changing restaurants, or they were in a management position here and going somewhere else, even if it is highly regarded. Yeah. Any little pieces of advice? Maybe it's not like the, the whole path should have changed, but maybe you yeah. should just keep this in mind, word to the wise yeah. kind of thing. Anything yeah. come to mind yeah. there? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's a, it's a very simple stoic approach in saying, okay, you know, just, just focus on what it is that you can control and, and really don't mind the rest because I've realized that that has essentially been at the core of my success whenever I've done something right. It's because I've had the courage to do just that. So I think that that, that that's main and it's, it's universal. You can use it in every, every kind of situation that you're in. So it, it allows you not to stress about things that can, can really bring you down, but you have no control over. I think that's very important. When people mention you or, or talk about how you navigate projects or, or your career, it's always around how I, how, how I observe it is something very values driven, very thoughtful. I'm going to list a few of the things here. Becoming the only Michelin star restaurant in 2013 with the highest Danish organic certification, changing Yeo's Bogod from a drug dealing neighborhood with street fights to what it is today, and even making staff meal healthier for your teams. Did you learn that at a specific restaurant? Is it more deeply rooted in your childhood? I've always wanted to ask you that, where that kind of thoughtfulness comes uh, from. Well, it's, it's, it's three, uh, um, quite different situations no? in terms of you know, the last one, making stuff more healthy. I don't know if I've made stuff more healthy, but I've chosen it to be a certified organic and that connects with the other thing, but mainly this, the staff food thing was to me, a discovery I had at the El Bulli where you, you would have so many strange things and like you, you were not allowed to try most of the food that you were doing, sure. like making like a, the, the, the Fran made a speech about, okay, you see the strawberry, if you try a strawberry as 50 of you, that's 50 strawberries. That's a lot of strawberries. Okay. I was like, okay, it's a lot of strawberries, but you know, it could have been nice to spend 50 strawberries on, on us knowing what a strawberry tastes like, for example. But when it came to staff food, there was no tolerance. Like it had to be good. It had to be good. And it like, if it wasn't right, it, it, the guy would just go nuts. And, and I was like, I, I really like that as a, as a core value, you know, it's, it's important because, you know, it reflects many things uh, that goes on in the kitchen. And I think it's very important and it also reflects, you know, my own heritage and how it's always been important what, what you eat and the it's the reason why I'm cooking. So, you know, and, and I think it was only a few years. I think as far as I remember in the beginning of Relay, we would maybe not the very beginning, but soon we started on Saturdays to do a, a 45 minute break sure. rather than 30. And, you know, it was like impressive on the last day of the week, you would have a little bit, you know, 50 more minutes was so much more and, and having a, a little a glass of wine because it was the last day and it was so nice. It was very much a, uh, a familial atmosphere and, and then, you know, after a bit, I was like, okay, if we can afford these 50 minutes today, why can we make this every day? And we did. And I think that really changed it for me because it became a real break. And it's, you know, in, in, in the restaurant industry might be uh, uh, fine dining or not. Uh, it, it can be really tough to have people sit down for five, 45 minutes and, and not having them actually sneak out and get something done. 
And I think uh, I'm very strict with that because I don't tolerate it because, you know, one guy stands up, then why is the other guy not standing up? And all of a sudden whoop, you're back at standing in the kitchen in a corner, eating fast for nine minutes. And then that's it. You, you have to impose these things. If not, it's not uh, done, even if it's for the best of people's souls. So. The best part about the content that I've been putting out there is I have people who resonate with that, what, what you're talking about, the, how I was brought up, isn't how I want to lead my organization. And so I want to make a culture change and people get stuck because there's not a framework for how to change culture all the time. So what has worked for you? Obviously you have the benefit of coming from the top and you can just make that, you know, call it a dictator decision of just like, this is what we're going to do. And yep. this is the standard. But do you have any advice for someone else who's wanting to kind of put a practice into place like what you're talking about and is struggling? But does not have the power to yeah. make the decisions? Yeah, or? yeah. Or either is struggling with a little bit of maybe the, the entire staff has been there for a long time and is like, this is weird. This is a change. I don't necessarily know if this is a good idea. How should they approach yeah. that? I think, I think that, I think that that is difficult if you are in a, in a context where you, you do, do, do not have the power to, to make those changes. I, I, I think it's, you, you will take some, some risk, there's some risks involved in it and they're embedded in it. And if you like, I've had some of my most precious collaborators and colleagues have been the ones that, that took those risks. They were capable of saying, Hey man, that's not, I don't know. That's not in line with what you normally would want people to do or something like that. And you know, it, have, it have, has made me reflect and whoever has been around me that has made me reflect that I've always been the ones that I've been wanting to work more with. Right. But that's me. That's not necessarily how another person would react. So, so the risk is what that I'm, I'm just, you know, you challenge my ideas about the world or, you know, you ask me at the wrong time, I'm too stressed or whatever, and then I start hating you and then your job is a misery from then on. That's a possibility. So I think that it's important to, to understand that the best you can do is to, to change what it is that you want to do. And, and the more power you have over the circumstances that you're in, the more you can influence those in the best possible way. And if you want to go beyond that, there's some big risks involved and it's not certain that it will, it will, you know, make the change that you want. But, but I think going forward and doing things in a certain way is the way to do it. But I think that example is more like, okay, run a little bit faster so that you are ready for service or whatever. Now th those are obvious things to say, but, but to go out and say, Hey, I think we should sit down for longer when we eat staff food. That's a difficult claim to make because it sounds like you, you want something better for yourself and that can come off to some people in the wrong way. You know? so, so it can cause you more trouble than, than good maybe. But how positive is that return on that investment? If your staff ends up being more engaged or you know, more focused during service because they've taken that time. I just think it, you know, showing, showing how the additional benefits, even though it seems like, oh, we're not being productive during that extra 15 minutes, it can actually. Yeah. I, I just find that, you know, if you're in a context of people wanting to do well and they're really busy and everybody wants to do a little bit better, then, then you, the, there is not enough time in the day forever to achieve that. Never. So, so you will just eat in on everything you can. And I think it's, it's fine to, to say, well, things need to be done well. And at the same time, limit the time that you can do it in. If you're capable of understanding and accepting that, you know, there's a limit to everything, but you have to push people to work faster so they can sit down for longer. There's no way around it. Like, because if not most, not everybody, but most will work themselves to death rather than having this more reasonable way of prioritizing say, I need to sit down, have a break and, you know, get back at it with more power after, but, but I need this break. You know, that's, that's it in, in a hard working environment that, that mindset is, is, is not always present. You mentioned El Bui as an experience and I, I, I know I mentioned Noma already, but I think so much, I mean, and I, I'm projecting here, so feel free to correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when I look at what you've accomplished and the way that you approach projects, the fact that you surrounded yourself with such high performers and innovators and experimenters throughout your career, it made it almost impossible for you to not approach things with a little bit of a, you know, 
tilted head of like, why are we doing this? I, I remember when my wife and I, she was my girlfriend at the time when we ate at Relay, it was the, the first time that I got to experience that, you know, a lot of chefs running the food, pulling open the table and seeing the service where, you know, a lot of the unfussy stuff that you, you kind of prioritize. And so do you credit a lot of that to what you've been able to like surrounding yourself with a lot of these people for so long? Or do you think there's like a minimum effective dose where people can spend time around someone who's thinking, you know, more productively with different values and then go off? Because yeah, how much time do you have to spend like that? And do you credit that towards what you've been able to do? I think there's a few elements to that. I think first of all, to, to innovate, you need to have a, some sort of creative personality. And I've come to realize that I have a creative personality. And to me, the easiest way to define that is to say, you know, I can, I can build a bridge between two things that most people maybe won't. Right. And my story of being an immigrant, and I think it's, it's, it's been defining me basically more than anything else. And that's essentially building a bridge between two cultures. So when you're an immigrant, you go and you observe and you see everything as a kid, particularly where you're very open-minded. You just see that, the, you know, where there used to be no grass, the grass is green, you know, where houses used to, used to be big, they're not that big. And people used to be dark haired, now they're blonde. Everything is just different. So it makes you very observational, right? And, and you, and you can see that everything that is around you might be different. And I think that that has really helped me having a certain mind. Then throughout my uh, career, I was lucky to, even though I was I was actually not looking for the super avant-garde creative places at all. I was very much more a uh, traditionalist in that sense, in looking what kind of cooking I wanted to master. It was more by coincidence than anything that I went to a booty. It was by getting to know a guy that had been there, da, 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 you had to go and I went, mostly because the way he was speaking about it, not because of what I knew about it superficially. And as I went there, I saw this way of deconstructing everything that, you know, you, you kind of have to have a very creative mindset to, to do obviously, because the booty was extremely avant-garde and it smashed everything and put it back together in a different way. And that's not necessarily the greatest thing to do always, but once you see it and you experience it, it's very inspiring as a thought process. And you were probably craving so it. Like you were like, just excited, so excited Pro to see Probably. It. Yeah. Yeah. Probably because I, I was, I, I came curious and I was extremely satisfied by all these strange things going on. Like, but in the long run, I didn't want to stay. Why? Because it was too much. Got it. I, I, you, you, sometimes you have to go to the extreme and come back. And I was at the extreme, but it wasn't my place. Like the kind of food that was there was just too strange. I, I, I was. I felt completely detached from it, except the staff food, <laughs> but, but you know, the, the, most of the preparations were just so absurd. I was like, what the hell is this? After half a year, it was too much. Yep. This is the, this is the other uh, sign for me that I've understood later on, way later on is of my creative personality, because what is your problem? Because it's not all a benefit when, when you keep looking at things and defining them and redefining them and see it, you kind of also need to do it, which means that you cannot stay in the same bread and butter situation for a very long time without your, your mind starting to wander, right? That that's sort of the, the, the burden of, of having this, this sort of brain. And then, you know, I saw what I saw at the booty. And then when I was at Noma, I, I kind of saw some similarities as well, where, you know, you, you had this place that all of a sudden was capable of, of creating something truly unique by just seeing things from a different point of view at the same place as everybody else, but just giving it a different approach. You know, it was another example for me that showed me, wow, you can, you can really do what you want. If you travel in and see how, what, what can I build that is special. And then, and then when it came to relay, it was sort of a, the, the child of my wanting to mix these things, you know, like some sort of high level cooking, but in a context that was not at all, as I have experienced it before, you know, simple food, but still some complexity underneath it, 
and a lot of these things that I wanted to bridge in my own kind of way, and I wanted to achieve it in my own kind of way, I had the opportunity to do it at Relay and, and I did it. And that was sort of the, the result of me being able to, to make my own choices. No? When you think back to those strat, whatever you call them, strategy sessions, planning meetings, ideation moments, were there innovations in the dining experience that you thought were good ideas? but ultimately didn't work? Because I think a lot of people hear about all the good stuff that you've obviously put into practice and that stuff stuck, but are there things that you thought would work, but they didn't? This, yes. And we're talking really now. Yes. 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 So I have a practical example and then uh, another idea. The, the, the practical example was like the first week we did like six people the first day, only people we invited, no? Just to try sure. it out. Six people and then like, 15 and then 25 and then like 40. And like, there was stuff that we changed after the first day. Like, oh my <laughs> God, this is just a horrible idea. I had this, and I spent so much time on it. I had this brilliant idea about this snack with these quail eggs that we had just cooked and they were in this little box and I had the box made and this and that. And there was a little, I wanted to do like a small Ikea kind of drawing about how you, cool. you know, like, you know, the, the little instructional thing on how you peel the quail egg. And, you know, I had a graphic design person do all this and like no one was even close to being able to peel these quail eggs. Like it was a disaster. I think we just crushed them and I was like, fuck, boom, that went straight away. First day. And, and another uh, thing, and that's, that's a, that's a long sort of acknowledgement or, or recognition I've had with the years. It's like Relay was, was a different animal than things that I've done since. Why? Because I built it very much around me and I built it in a way that I was supposed to be there all the time. And I was there all the time for the first uh, number of years. And within that framework, I could make just about everything work because I knew how to do it. And I, I, I did things that I believed that I could do. And if I could do it, everyone else could do it. And I would, if they wouldn't be able to do it, I would do it until they would get it. Right. And th that, that philosophy I brought with me to do other things. And I realized with, realized with time that it was, that it was simply naive to think that that's the way it was because as when you, when you're an entrepreneur and you have your own restaurant or whatever it might be, you you probably go at 130% pace, at least, right? If, if you are ambitious, you, 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 uh, you just want to put all, all you have into it, all your life, all your soul, everything into it. And, and then when you at this, you build something around you and you're going at 130%, everyone around you might not be at 130, but they're for sure at 110, right? So, because they, they just see you when they come in. Blah, 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 that, that whole thing and, and you really lead by example all the time. As soon as the organization grows and you do more projects, you know, you, you might go at 130, but you're spreading yourself out more into more context. And obviously that is perceived a little bit different than your 130. And then the people around you are not at 110 anymore. They're less. I realized. You know, it was a couple of years ago, I realized it at base where I kind of like to, to put myself where I can also be in a front of house sort of, uh, situation on, oh, I can do the section. I can do a section, a front of house section at base. And, and I, I love doing it and I enjoy doing it and I'm really good at doing it, but I've done it for many years. I have many years of experience and, you know, I can, I know all the rules because I made them. And I can bend all the rules because I made them. And you know, I'm just having a great time. I'm doing great, but it's also hard and it's really busy. And I almost have a hard time keeping up with everything I want to happen. No. And then I realized how the hell are people that, you know, might work two days a week, be even close to perform what I want to perform on, on this given task. No, it's impossible. So I realized with time. That this way of, of thinking that everybody would be able to do what I can do, which is completely wrong. It's completely wrong. I need to understand more how to make sure that, that the people that are there 
can, can, can do and can be successful in doing what they need to do rather than if I can do it, because there's just some things that I can do that they can't do. And now in practical terms, I've re relayed, like one of the beauties of our relay was that, that, you know, you would be able to walk in and, and the guy doing the cold section would look up and check you into the booking system and seat you at the table and show you the wardrobe and might be even the same person pouring you the wine halfway through your meal. And everybody would be able to just do just about everything, but it was because it was built on how I wanted to do just about everything. So as a, as a, as a, like a, a fast school of restaurateurs, I think it was phenomenal because you could see how I made this restaurant from A to Z every day. It's different when it becomes a little bit bigger and it's not possible to, to keep mimicking this without going crazy. Like that's just, it's too much. When I'm going to, I'm going to flip the question. And so you have a lot of people who have tried different styles of dining innovation and ways of serving things and ways of staffing restaurants and different concepts. Is there a innovation that you have in the back of your mind where you're like, this is going to work. It just needs to be executed properly, but you just, we just haven't seen it yet or something that you would like to see brought into reality, but it just doesn't exist yet. I, I do think that, uh, and it's not necessarily a grandiose vision of me or anything, but, but I do think that we will see a much more digitalized, the restaurant experience faster than we think. And I kind of try to push it a little bit too, because really? It's as, yeah, it's, I think it's beneficial for, for, for the restaurant. Again, back to, back to the point from before, you know, like if we're talking my current situation at the base, I can explain you all the charcuterie and, you know, I can do all these things and, 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 and then I also know that some of the guests that are sitting there might not know these things, right. And, and I know that I can train the staff for them to potentially be able to explain to the guests, but this is a very, very tricky uh, job to succeed at because staff is very, very limited resource now. And it's, you know, it's very difficult to build in competence into staff that doesn't stay for very long because you have a, a in and out of staff that I think has been it's like, it's worse than ever before, particularly front of house, particularly here. In Denmark, it becomes very difficult. And, and I think in the end, if you, if you have like your core concept and your, your core values here and the guest is there, you want to put them as close together as you can. And for sure, the guest is more close to their phone than they are to the front of house person. You know what yeah. I mean? So I'm really trying to think of ways of how can we communicate clearly to the guests through digitalized solutions, you know, we're trying the QR code menus and we've done like the full on, like it started with the, the, the lockdowns where it was kind of everywhere. I saw like, okay, this is an opportunity to get going with this. Let's try this out. And it was just a little postcard that we show you something and then you would scan it menu. Now we're at a place where it's kind of a hybrid, you know, I have uh, on the printed menu, I have things that I don't need to update very often. And it's the stuff that I want you to think about, which is the menus. <laughs> I want you to have the big experience. That's, that's what I spent my, my real estate on now, because I don't have to put all the information there. And then there's a code where you can see the rest, which gives me a moment for you to stop thinking about the pizza you want and think about something else. And then, and then you'll get to the pizza if you want to work for it. You know? And I think that this is, this is, this is where things will go because you will be able to tailor an experience more uh, than with the, with the super qualified front of house staff. Now in, in the more gastronomical world, you know, you, we, we are kind of spoiled with this, oh, uh, you know, you, you expect the service level to be at a certain point, you know, but, but this is exactly what I was against at, at relay. Like, the whole point of relay was that I'm not going to pour your water, man. Like it just makes no sense for me. And you think that you're not paying for me pouring the water. That's not how it is. I prefer cutting this down and making it a little bit more like this, you know, and to some extent going further down this road 
is, is doing some of these things that, you know, at the time of relay, you would be fine dining thinking, what is this kind of shit? You know, why, how can you not crumb the tables? How can you not pour the water, all that stuff. And I think that today we will look, we're looking badly at the QR codes and the, the, the wireless on the iPads and people being able to order and you see it as a fast food thing, but believe me, sooner or later, once it's done right and, and the, and the guests are more and more accustomed to it, they will happily do it because to have a good service requires good service and requires a good context. And my philosophy has been from the very beginning, the less service you have to do, the better service you can do because the less of a, an exposure you have to, to, to the guest, the, the better you can be in, in, in the context that you're actually being put in. Right. It was a thing we did a lot of relay where it was like, we would, we would, the, well, you remember if you were there, but there, there would be a glass, a big, like half the door would be glass when you would walk in. No? So it means that if you would go in and the door would be locked, you would be able to look in and you know how it is the, the 15 minutes before you open up, everything's chaos and you play loud music and you just, ah, you get ready for service and you don't want anybody in there. And, and it's for the best of everybody to have this place empty. So, but the problem is if guests come in and the door is locked and they look in the class and you, you look at them, you're like, no, 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 you look like an idiot. So what was my solution to this? It wasn't to let the guests come in and tell them we'll be right there. No, put a curtain so they can't see you. If you put a curtain, they can't see you. You don't do bad service. You just didn't see them. And that, that's exactly my point. You know, the, the less service that you, that you have to give, the better you can give it because you are at the, at the thing. If you pick up the phone, you'll be polite. If the phone, phone is not accessible, well. Cause then when your staff does have those human interactions, they can be of higher quality versus these little menial tasks yeah. that it doesn't actually benefit yes. from human involvement. Yes, 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 yes. You, I have a lot of people reaching out because they're working at a place that might have an open kitchen or a counter, or they're even wanting to just be better at writing menus. And I have this principle that I like to share of just get better at talking about food. Maybe it's for certain people, it's writing about food that gets them just kind of better at articulating their thoughts around flavors and how to present a dish and how to get a guest excited about it. How, do you, do you t go through any sort of training with, with your teams or have there been any resources that you found valuable when you're thinking about talking about food and do you put just as much weight on it as I do? When you say talking about food with who do you mean? With the guest. With the guest. So my, my approach has, has, has been always to minimize that as well, as in, I I'm, I'm a strong believer that it's, it's a little bit the same with the wine. If you go to a table and here you are, and you have many years of training and this is your passion and there's so many details in this, and you risk going to a table, talking to yourself rather than talking to the guests. And I think that's a big problem at times in, uh, the, the higher level you go. In restaurants, this, I think it's the big flaw of many of these restaurants is that you assume in a restaurant like that, that because people have chosen to come here, they really want to hear everything I have to say. It's not necessarily so. And again, if you're very skilled as a chef in an open kitchen or a front of house person, you can sense that, but it requires a lot of experience. So I prefer being minimalist in this sense. And trying to say that, you know, 99% of the people would want to know a few things that they can relate to when they eat this. And if, if you approach most table this way and start by making your rounds this way and trying to limit yourself a little bit, the greatest thing is if you like, you know, in writing, it's the same thing. If you're capable of saying it in a sentence, you really got it right. So this is a way of practicing this. You go there and you try and make it happen in two, three seconds. It's a sentence, two sentences. That's it. It doesn't mean that you should know more than this. You formulate this sentence based on more things that you know. But once you're at the table and you realize that these people are interested in more and they might even have a question for you and you can answer that question, 
That's the magic. But that's not 99% of the people. That might be, let's say 10% of the people. And the less time you spend on telling people shit that they don't want to hear about, the more time you have for the 10% that want to ask you the questions. And then you have a conversation, which is useful for you and for the person because they actually ask for it. The same goes with the wine. This is a huge problem, I believe, with many, many, many super wine experts is that they are not people's experts. So when they go to the table, they don't get what these people want. They know everything about the wine and they feel that because they are skilled and because they are at a high level, they need to make sure that everybody here knows how skilled they are. But that doesn't make up a bit of experience. To some, it might, you know, to some, might. oh my God, the, the wine guy. You know, blah, 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 blah. Yes, but in the end, I, I prefer a more humble, more minimalist approach that then leaves room for the expertise to be built in behind it. And if people want to open the door and they're like, okay, this guy really knows. That's impressive. And you avoid a lot of unnecessary everything, you know, and again, looking at it from a restaurant or restaurateur point of view, again, this was relayed with it up to 70, 75 covers, sometimes 80, with just two front of house people, you know, which is like, you know, the, the chefs are obviously very involved, but this is, this, this requires that you get that phrase, you understand how this wine is and you just hammer it out there. But I know for a fact. You know what I would get if I would get the third, the fourth, and the fifth front of house person? I wouldn't get more quality. I would get longer sentences. Interesting. Because to, to some extent, you need to apply some pressure for some concentration to be done, you know, particularly in front of house service. You touch on this point, experience, and I think you had your way of progressing through your career and I, I had mine and the listener has, has their own, but I'm kind of obsessed with cracking this nut of you have two people who may or may not have grown up in the same city or gone to the same school or been at the same restaurant. And you look at their career trajectory five years down the track and one has such vastly different experiences and a more robust skill set and a better developed repertoire. Than somebody else who ended up getting, you know, stagnant or, or, or stopped improving. Do you have any things for people to keep in mind as they're thinking about experience? Because of course, looking back, it's like, oh, this person has experience. It's easy to sum up in one sentence, but how do you, de how do you define experience? How can someone think about getting better experience? Yeah. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts there. Well, the, the, the quality of the experience is, is just. It just, it's so varied. And I, and I think sometimes, you know, I was actually, I was thinking about this the other uh, time where I'm in the advisory board of the, the hospitality uh, college, I guess you would call it English here, the hospitality school. And, and they're really struggling to how to, you know, make, make a school that makes any sense, an education that makes any sense for chefs. They're struggling like crazy. It's very, very difficult. The numbers are going down, very little interest. I remember when I started chef school, it was like this moment where everybody was so interested in being chefs. It was like the beginning of the, 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 the TV chef stuff. And everybody was like, oh, everybody wants to be a chef now, but that didn't last long. Uh, you know, now it's, it's kind of uh, different, but the, the struggle here is that the way that you understand what a chef should be able to do is extremely antiquated, right? And it comes from a time where you, and they still do this for the exams here, where you do uh, these classical dishes that I would bet you, you would not be able to find it in any restaurant anywhere. Like it is museum food. It doesn't exist. It's not made anywhere. Nobody buys it anywhere. I don't know what the point is. Like it's inexistent, but at the time when this stuff was done, and conceived, and that was your exams, and you were trained chef when you were able of doing these things. The, the the fine restaurants of this city, we're talking probably the seventies, right? They would probably make small variations of those same things, the restaurants, and that would be about it. You know, you wouldn't have 
Chinese restaurants, bistros, whatever, Mexican restaurants, whatever. It would be this sort of French influenced old school Danish gastronomy defined by a limited number of people in a limited number of restaurants. And, you know, there would be some sort of hierarchy amongst those where some were better than others. And, you know, some were, and I guess in those years, some people started to challenge that and then it became different. No? But at the time it made sense that that was what you were trained to do because you would go out and get a job where this is what you were required to do to some extent, more or less, you could excel in that or not. And here today, they're trying to find out what is it that we need to teach people to do. And I'm literally like, there's no fucking way that you can ever do something that would be useful in every context that you can be in as a chef. It's like, it's not even one job. It's a thousand jobs. It's a thousand different jobs in different places. You can be a chef in a fast food restaurant. You can be frying chicken all day. You can be putting parsley twigs on something all day. You can stamp out pumpkin seeds all day. You can do, you know, you can run a kitchen on your own all day. You could like, man, it's like, it's as universal as, as cooking and eating is for everyone. Cooking professionally is like as diverse as, as that almost, you know? So, so what kind of quality experience? Like, I don't know, man. Like it's, there's, there's no way to define it because it depends on what do you need this experience for and what, what are you going to put it to use for? Do you want to make your own restaurant? What kind of a restaurant is that? You know, if you, if you're interested in opening a, a fast food franchise, who am I to tell you what kind of experience you need? I have no clue. You know, but you know, and I might look at that or what you want to do that, but it's not up to me to decide that if that's what you want to do, then, then probably find, find that experience of quality because that's your different criteria of quality that, that you like. And then, you know, so it's like how, how to graduate the level of quality of experience. There's only one way. And that is by seeing where do you want to go? And is this helping me on my way there? You've shared that this next chapter for you involves mentoring and investing and consulting this next generation of talent. What are you looking for in that talent? If anything, what does your experience allow you to see in them? Or are there qualities or principles or patterns that you're trying to identify? Well, I think to me, it's, I don't know if, if talent is, 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 is that important to me? To be honest, like, because what is talent? And again, based on what I just said, like in what context you can tell that, you know, some people have a, a palette that is special. You can tell when people have some sort of dexterity where they, they can plate something and it just looks outstanding, you know, because they just have it, they have an aesthetical sense and they, they can use their, their hands in the right way. You know, those things are important, but again, for what? Does that make you a, a good restaurant tour? It's not, it's not your fingers that do that. Right. Um, but what I think is, is key is a mix of personality and courage because to do something great, you need the personality to, to again, stick out a little bit. Before I said, uh, as a creative, you, you need to build a bridge between some things, no? but, but I think if you have, if you have character, you, you are capable of having the integrity towards what your own thoughts and feelings and ideas are, and not necessarily compromise on them because uh, your surroundings want that, your investor want that, your Michelin guy want that, something like this, you know? So, so that, I think that that creates something that is a particular mix that only you can be and therefore you know you get to test out in the market whether there is a, a demand for that or not obviously but if you just do whatever is mainstream and out there how how can you develop like you know just there have to be some things I, the, the greatest example i have for that is uh, silpa bauer matthias silpa bauer that has taken over manfred's old space and is doing silpa bauer's bistro 
And this guy, he worked uh, for me in all the different places. Then he took off to Southern France. He cooked fish there. He totally fell in love with Nice and so Southern Mediterranean France. Came back. Uh, he got a mission star there, by the way. Then he came back and wanted to do a fish bistro and da, 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 da. And then he started off by doing a pop-up at the a relay at one point after closing or whatever. And you know, he's like, uh, yeah, I want to have uh, uh, an espresso coffee, you know, the little machine. And I'm like, are you, are you fucking idiot or that's, that's stupid, you know, and all this I've taught you and now you want to use espresso coffee. So you're out of your mind. But on the other hand, I kind of like that he has the courage to, to want that, you know? I thought it was for the wrong reason, so to say, because why do you want that? Well, because that's what they have in Nice. No, but he's enamorated with this idea and he wants to put himself in this context. And he, he, he wanted to have this thing. And I was like, that's stupid. But because you disagree with me, you have character. And that is not for everybody. And he's shown it's been extremely successful by doing something that obviously has quality and obviously is well done and all these things. It's unique because he's not doing what everybody's doing. He's doing what he really feels he wants to do. And that is character. And courage to me means fighting for your own character, you know, having, having the guts to put yourself out on a plate and say, I want to do an espresso, even though it's not, you know, I'm a proponent for certain zeitgeist, you know, at this time saying that to me, you must be an idiot or you just really have some guts to say that, you know? And, 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 and I have respect for that. I have much more respect for that than to people that are nodding to the sustainability. It's all good. It's all good. You know what I mean? I mean that that's, I think that that's a uh, remarkable. And I think that that is what can define a restaurant experience that is memorable. And, and I think to make a business out of a restaurant, you, you know, it's not like we need restaurants, you know, it's like there's plenty of restaurants. So if you want to do something, do something that is unique. And the only way you can truly do that in an authentic manner is by doing what you really want to do. Two things stick out there. One being like you and I can have a conversation about a concept or an idea or a chef that we both really like and that we'd like to see succeed. But like, ultimately the market's going to decide, like, it's like you and I can agree on yes. something, but the market's going to make the final decision, yes. which I think is, yes. you know, yes. point one. And then. But, but I get uh, to, to that, I, just to comment on that is don't listen to the market up front. Right. You, you know what I mean? Yep. Like yep. to some extent you need to see, you know, what do I believe in this, but, but you need to make yourself the market. You know what I mean, if you want to do something truly special, it's this thing, it's, it's an obvious, like a Steve Jobs thing. Who knew we needed an iPhone? Well, nobody, right? If you ask the market, do you need an iPhone? It'd be like, what the fuck is this? So for, to make true innovation, you need to be able to go beyond it. No. But, but you will essentially end up testing it. There's no way around the market if you want to make a business. So in the end, it will, it will foolproof what it is that you do. The second point I had was you mentioned personality and courage as things that the, th that person that you're, that, that talent needs because it is the weapon you use against the two obstacles you're going to run into, which is leading a group of people and risk like you yeah. use your personality to lead people and you need to approach risk with courage and so i think that, yes, that yes, like yes. that that's how i'm drawing a little bit of similarities here because yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. it's so poignant that you you need to have both and i think that's so yeah. interesting i had a young chef reach out to me with such a pointed question i'm happy to share my answer if you want to hear it but i, I thought i'd ask you to get your thoughts on it and he asked me how do i know when a chef is trying to mentor me why would you ask yourself that question? I mean, to, to me, whoever, if, if anyone lines up to mentor me, I'm more than happy to listen what, to what they say. I think it's a question of listening. You don't need to define a person as a mentor. You know, you don't even, you don't need to define experiences that as learnings there will eventually be. So to me, a mentor is someone that you, you really listen to if they say mm -hmm. something, because it has proven to be so that, you know, it was kind of some smart shit that they said at one point, you know, like, I want to hear what this guy thinks about this. That's, I mean, the, the, the question 
you should answer this question with a question is it uh, you know, why are you not the, the mentee? Right. Or, or is it yeah. like, you need to, you need to, th this is where you need to find out. If you're not, find out what you want to do, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. You know, what, if you can get something out of it, for, take everything you can. It's, all, it's almost like, don't be a passenger. Like don't, don't wait on the sidelines, like yeah. get mentored. This, this to me, this, this is, this is to me a, a, a key, 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 key thing about learning and progress and it relates a little bit to a question you had before, what I didn't say, but is this, this way of uh, expecting that you can passively learn things like that's not how it works, man. Like you, 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 you only learn by really engaging in what it is that you do and you can learn from whatever situation you're in, if you're engaged in it. I think a lot of people end up, as you say, as a passenger, a little bit as a tourist, but boating around in different contexts and expecting externalities to, to somehow rub something off of them so they get smarter. While what you should do is to focus on what it is that you're doing and see, can I do this a little bit better? Can I, can I, is this, you know, think about it, absorb it, engage in it. And, and, and this builds up experience, not touching your shoulder next to someone or something. Because that does not necessarily give you anything. Again, in, in terms of quality of experience, you can be in a very renowned place and, and maybe experience that you got very few things out of it. You know, it depends on you, man. You are the one that's supposed to learn and no one is in the world. No one was put into this world to teach you anything. You know what I mean, like if you see it this way and you understand that you know, in Italian, you say that an art is stolen, you know, that a craft is stolen. You steal it from your master, you know, and like you, you need to see how they do it. You sneak and say, oh, that's the secret to this recipe kind of thing. And I like that approach because obviously it's not like that, but, but it's like, you have the initiative, man. If you're stealing, you have the initiative. It's not like, oh, here I, I bestow upon you this knowledge. No, that's, that's. Wait for too long if that's a, if that's the situation you're in. It puts ownership on you. Like like you you have these people who are like, oh well, I could be at X Y Z restaurant. I just haven't found a mentor yet, or I could be like this, but no one's whatever for me yet. And it's it's a, it's a personal sovereignty advantage yeah. that you can give to yourself if you're yeah. taking this approach, which I think is great. Also, also today is like at the time where you would have to steal a craft from a master. This is the time where recipes would be in a safe, or this is the time where in a, on a section, you would only be able to make the soups and that's all you were taught because then you, if you knew the soups and the steaks and the sauces, you would just go and open a restaurant, right? So that's how everybody would be on their own section. Now I have people that are after three, four months, they want to change sections because they feel they've seen everything so far, no, but, but all information is readily available for you at all times, you know? You, you don't need anybody to learn things. I would, I would say in, in, because of, of course you do, but, but you don't need anybody to give you the information that you think you lack. It's not the information. The learnings are more than information. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's lived experience. It's not tell me how to do this. No, it's, it's being embedded in it. And sooner or later, you, you, your body and your mind moves in a different way because you've been there. And when you cannot define what it is that you learned, then, then you, it was really something that has touched you right? and changed you. You don't get that from, from information or recipes or plating or techniques. It's, it's, it's different. I find it's different. When you think about the advisorship that you give to the hospitality school in Denmark, is, are there changes that you you wish you could make or, or, or that you think might work on a smaller scale or through a different project that could help provide potentially an alternative towards hospitality education? I, I think that hospitality education is kind of done. Like I, I cannot see mm. the purpose of it. I, I have to be honest with you. In, in Denmark, you have to, you have to see, you have to understand the broader context because in Denmark, all sort of technical educations build the same way carpenter, you know, blacksmith, chef, and everything else that where you use your hands, how do a technical school, some theory, and then you do practical apprenticeship, that apprenticeship where you are, say you're a chef, you're in a restaurant, 
sends you to school a couple of times where you do some theory, right? And if you're a carpenter, you learn by doing because you are assisting some carpenter somewhere and so on. I think that that model made a lot of sense back in the day. The problem is what I said before, the complexity of the industry now is so incredibly vast that no system can, you know, apprehend it or get, get all of it in that. And second of all, like the, the way that this is defined here is by the unions and by the, how do you say the, the work givers unions, right? The two entities that sort of define what kind of education do we want? And in the Danish model, this is extremely important and they value it very highly. And the problem is that both unions and the other entity are very much not up to date. So, so they, they keep it antiquated and it's not going anywhere. I cannot see how this system should be able to provide what the industry wants, because I can tell you already now that it's not doing so. I have never shown my diploma to anyone ever. No one have ever asked me about my diploma ever. I have never asked for anybody's diploma ever. So what is it that this thing gives us? It's not there. There's no, there's no demand for it. And, and the supply is now going down and they're trying to find out how can we up the supply, but nobody's asking for it. The, you have to understand that there's also a waiters a sort of education here that is completely desolate. There's almost nobody applying for it and I can understand it. And there's, there's very, it's very, very difficult to find staff to do front of house in general, traditionally, and more now than ever, it's something that people do sort of part-time think that that's fine. So I could see that, you know, essentially the best thing you could do was to be able to offer something that would be theoretical crash course that would give you everything between three and six months of preparation about what it is that you need to get out of the restaurant industry. And that's about it because the formation that you, again, as I said before, the formation that you want to have, you need to be able to define it because that's the next problem in this industry is that not many people live long in this industry, right? I think the average is like five years for, for trained professionals, five years and, and the education is like three and a half. So what's the sense in that? Do a six months crash course, see if it's for you, find your niche, improve, get competent, amass skills, and maybe if it didn't go well, as in financially or whatever, you don't become independent, then, then you have, you have mastered something that you fucking sure use for something else. But, but I don't, I don't see a hospitality, a school, college being sustainable going forward. I'm almost, you know, kind of reminded of the answer you gave to service where is there, you know, some sort of digital aid that can be provided to this, where it's not this, you have to go in person six months to a campus and spend time doing practical exams. Maybe there is a little yeah. bit of, you know, there's a balance and that's like so much of the content yeah. that I try to put out for the industry is like, is the, regardless of, I, I think I looked at my website traffic the other day, it was like so many countries consuming things that I, I, I hope help people because I put it out there yeah. on the internet because that's, you have the power of scale and, and, and maybe there's yeah. something there. Yeah, definitely. I want to get into a couple of rapid fire questions if, if that's all right, but it, sure. is there anything that we didn't cover or anything that you wanted to continue think, to chat I think on? It's good. Okay. That's good. Okay, great. You somehow get a call right after this interview that you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at whatever restaurant you want. And when you get there, there's someone you've always wanted to speak with waiting to have dinner with you. What is that restaurant and who is that person? Oh shit. That's a super difficult question. Well, first of all, the restaurant is easy. For me, that's my favorite restaurant. That's Echibari in, uh, in the Basque uh, country. Again, I talked about personality before. I talked about, uh, uh, character. I think that really has all the right proportions of these things. You know, you, have you, have you, I know, I don't know if you've been to Echibari. Yes. But, uh, I love, I love yeah. that place. The, the, uh, no, we had a magical lunch there years ago and ended it up, uh, it was the world cup was, 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 was going on and uh, then I was playing later. So we were, uh, sitting downstairs after lunch, drinking beers, playing cards, watching the game on TV. I mean, that, that can go on 
after the most magical dining experience, I'm like, this is just absolutely in love with this restaurant. Absolutely in love with this restaurant. So yes, that, that would be, that would be the restaurant, the person, someone say again, someone I really want to. You've always wanted to talk with. And, and, and the thing that I like to add for guests is they can be living or living dead. Oh, so okay, 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 okay. Yeah. It can be someone in the, in the well, past. Well, I have, I have this, this thing and I, is, COVID and lockdowns and all that shit really made me, gave me time to reflect a lot about things. And I think a lot when I'm busy. So when I'm not busy, you know, I have fumes coming out of my ears because there's just so much going on. And, and I was, I was lucky to, to encounter stoicism as a philosophy in the beginning of actually just before the lockdowns, February, February, 2020. And uh, it was introduced to me by my girlfriend that I had only met for like six, seven months prior to that. And it became a thing for us together. And I've been, because at the time then I just went all in about all the books, read about all the philosophers. I was just so enamored by this, this way of approaching life. And I became a father in December and I decided to, uh, well, we decided, but I was asked if I could find a name for the kid. And I named him Aurelio, which is amazing based on Marcus Aurelius. And that brings me to the point is that if I would want to meet anybody, if I have someone that I only have reverence towards, if it will be Marcus Aurelius, since it can be a dead character because such a mythical, the perfect person, but still not flawless, you know, like such a fantastic uh, character. And I, I, I didn't realize until then th how I needed a person that I could always look and say, what would this guy do? You know, what, what, what would be, what would he say? This is the right thing to do. And you know, in a world where religion is not necessarily something you have, I, I realized how extremely important a philosophy is and to have some sort of something that goes beyond your life that you can, you can look at and, and really trust for, for its values. I think that that's it. So, so that would, that would be, that would be a very exciting, uh, lunch or uh, dinner at the uh, Ichibari though. But uh, yeah, yeah. What and would, I'm sure he would like it too. What would you ask him? Is there anything that you would like love to? Oh shit, man. I, I, I don't know. Like just about everything, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I not, I don't have, because, you know, he almost answers all questions. Right. Through, right. through his, and that's what they say. Philosophy is speaking to the dead, you know, like mm. by reading one book, he has literally made one book and I have it in my bag. I have it. Yeah. There it is. Meditation. Famous cover. Yes. Oh, and, and it's, and it's like, like bookmarked to the nines from you. you yeah. Just have pages. And, and it's. It's, I, I keep it in my bag and it's been a long time since I've, I've uh, looked at it because, you know, life is busy, but it's just, you know, it gives me something to have it with me. And in, in that, that you could, we could talk about again, reducing and being minimalist about what you say, like this has the answers for everything, literally. And look at this. If you compare it to the Bible, this is, uh, you know, 189 pages. It's right. nothing. Right. This is pretty concise, you know, and, but, but then. Imagining a conversation with this person would be just about everything, you know, small things, not necessarily the grandiose questions, because I think that those are, those are answered here, but you know, s small things and, and see what, what kind of a person is, is there. Yeah. I think what's so fascinating about the recent, you know, popularity of stoicism. I'm a huge fan of it. I've recommended books by an author named Ryan Holiday, who writes a lot on, uh, about stoicism and. I think what's so fascinating about it is that in this new, everything is fresh, create contents, come up with new ideas, style culture. Yeah. We think we yeah. need new information, but in reality, so many people have found this wisdom and the answers, as you're saying, in this old stuff, like it's so old and you think that we're going through these new problems when in reality, it's, it's nothing new. People have gone through this before. It's so interesting. Yeah. And it, it's, it's such a. When you think about it, it's such an obvious reaction. Everything is chaos. Everything is new. Everything is liquid. And you know, from one day to the other, everything's changed upside down. Every, everything. So, so what do you seek? Something that is 
foolproof, something that is set in stone, something that does not change and has not changed for thousands of years because you need it. You need that sort of order to see everything just, ah, uh, you could, you can get back at it. And that I, I, you know, on social media and communication, you know, I, I use it, I need to use it, but I always have in mind some values that keep me healthy. You have spent so much time in this industry and you've done a lot of different concepts and types of cuisine and, and worked at different restaurants. Is there a technique that you still look at and you're like, I'm kind of intimidated by that. An actual cooking technique? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I don't, I think, I think I'm intimidated and at the same time, I'm in a place where I'm, I'm fine with being intimidated by many more things than you would think. I mean, it's not like, oh, there's one thing I don't master. I think there's, there's so many things. And it was something that I, I got with me from my, my Noma days. I started at Noma as a, as a sous chef. And I was literally just thrown in to it at age 24. So I was just thrown into it, you know, and I realized straight away that I had to sort of fake it till you make it kind of thing. But then again, not because fake it till you make it is kind of a, I don't really like it as an expression because I don't think you should fake many things, but in the end, accepting the fact that I wasn't good at something and, and wasn't afraid to show that I wasn't made me much better at it much faster. I really realized that that was the key. So, so, you know, with a chef of experience, you can, you can end up having this idea that you should know everything, which is completely impossible. And I think that be, being nervous about that and not being secure about yourself, if you think that you need to know everything is what really can fuck you up. So my point is just like, when there's something I don't know how to do, I think I'm fine with it. Again, I was saying before. There's a thousand jobs in this industry. Like you cannot be good at all of it. There must be something, you know, there must be a fit. You know, sometimes it happens and people, I don't think people talk enough about it. You know, sometimes you do it, whatever you, you're butchering a fish and you just kill it. You know, it's just, fuck what happened. That must happen. You know, why should, why should that happen? Like, you know, things go wrong sometimes. And I think, I think that it's very liberating not to trying to keep up some sort of uh, surface about you being so good at everything because. You, you want people to think better of you. I think that that's a bad, that's a bad way of doing it. It's a bad strategy. Last two questions for you. You go into your kitchen on, on your first day of your weekend, you know, it's like casual morning and uh -huh. you're making eggs for yourself or maybe for, for your yeah. girlfriend. How do you make those eggs? I just, I just uh, put up a thing on social media about how I was making my right. scrambled eggs. That's crazy. I love I it. That yesterday. <laughs> But uh, what I like eggs, and I, I want to put this straight once and for all, because people give me, give me shit for, for doing eggs the way I do it. I don't care how the Root Brothers makes uh, scrambled eggs. I don't care how anybody makes scrambled eggs. If I want to make scrambled eggs in a certain way, I make them in a certain way. And I think that that's completely valid, whether you are a trained one way or the other. I like obviously quality eggs. I like a hot pan with brown butter. I, I actually do clarified and brown butter for my home kitchen as well. And the way I do it is I think smart. And I think people should pay attention is that you make a clarified butter. And once you've made your clarified butter, which we all know how you, you make, you know, just low temp, whatever, just let it sit. Then when you've decanted all that, the rest, you cook it, you cook it, you cook it into brown butter because there's much more fat in that always. So if you keep whisking that and you cook it to about 180 degrees, you get perfectly browned butter and you get all the fat with you because you can strain that off, right? Instead of only having to skim it from the top or decanting it. That brown butter, I put in a hot pan. I want it hot and I throw the eggs in there and I literally give them eight seconds. Shh, 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 shh. Take them off. Now on my thing on social media, I put some uh, blue cheese in it. I saw that. That's yeah, that, that could, that could be one way of doing what I also really like is to put anchovies on Love it. it. Yeah. Salt umami. That's my Yeah, 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 yeah. Delicious. But I don't eat breakfast though. I eat it mostly for lunch. Got it. Got it. Got it. What's one thing that you've changed your mind on in recent memory? Fuck, oh, so many things, man. So many things. I was just talking to, to, to a friend this morning and we're discussing about all sorts of things. And I just realized that it's, I've become much more skeptical towards myself <laughs> the, the last years, because I've realized that things that I was so dead set on years ago 
you know, and I was so convinced that whoever was wrong was wrong. You know, with years, it happens to me often that I kind of say, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe they had a point. Like being from, from their point of view, maybe they had a point about this. And maybe, maybe the world is just way more complex than me being so certain about some things. You know, obviously this, the, the, the skepticism, I think people think of it wrongly, but instead of being like Socratic method, they think of it being skeptical to the big man, you know, being skeptical to vaccines or being skeptical to whatever's going, the government and all that. I think it's more being skeptical about your own opinions. It's like, think about it. Is, is it really so? And not so much tending to say, this is the way the world works and I'm going to fight for it. I'm more like, it might be this way. I'm very intrigued by it <laughs> and I, and I just reflect more on it. So, so, and th that, that to me is like, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I've been a proponent for uh, sustainability and I'm like, oh, it's just so difficult to understand that that's my point now, you know, eat more vegetables. Okay. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. Like, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to understand. I also understand that when you face a crisis, everybody wants to get a solution, just get at it. But it's just way more difficult than that. And I realized that talking in these absolute terms is, 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 is not necessarily beneficial because you'd leave out a lot of the complexity. And I, th I think that's a way more uh, interesting conversation to have with people around you, but more than anything with yourself. Humans crave absolutes. Like we want the answers. We want to be able to look at of a course. situation and of say course. like, this is right. This is wrong. Dark and light, you know, yeah. it's not always the case. It, and, and that makes sense and that makes sense, but, but, uh, you know, as to say the, it's the simple solutions for the complex problems, but then again, you, you, you don't really understand the problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was listening to this guy saying, you know, there's no, there's, there's no solution. There's only trade-offs. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point because, you know, you cannot solve anything. You can just shift the balance to some extent. I think that that's a nice approach to have. And. You know, I've put a lot of thoughts in about many of the things that I've done and, and, you know, championed, and I won't say that disagree with myself because I, I, I don't necessarily, but, I, but I'm much more, I'm much more trying to understand now rather than, than preaching to how things should be. I'm not the one to say how things should be. I'm just trying to make things better in my own life and hoping that that brings me somewhere. I'm going to put this last point on, on the, on the T. Because you might have already answered this, mm -hmm. so you can leave it if you want. But the yep. last question that I always mm -hmm. like to ask folks is, what do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? So if you have any other thoughts there that you'd like to pass along. Yeah, well, I, th I think I think that it's uh, like cooking is uh, is going extinct. Like, I think that that's, that's truly it. And I, I, I keep wondering about how, like, you know, we think of our grandmothers as this this fortress that keeps up our culinary her heritage no? and, and, you know, with generational change, grandmothers are, unfortunately tend to die sooner or later. And then, and then, you know, then the, the next generation, our parents may be not as skilled and not as thoughtful about food and they're not spending as much time in food. And then the next generation, even less, and it seems the current generations and the young generations are literally completely detached from the food that they eat. And, and I think that there's only, there's only really the professionals that are, that are enamored with cooking that are left to keep up some sort of culinary heritage. So I think that we, we kind of have a responsibility that to some extent we need to try and keep up. Obviously understanding that, you know, I was saying before with the menus and stuff like this, technology is there and it, it will, it will make us move in certain direction. I think fighting it is not, it's, it's kind of a Sisyphus battle. Like it's not going to work to fight it, but, but you know, there's things that I find so precious to me in my life and my childhood and my everyday life that I feel are at risk for my son future. And if not for them, then for sure for my grandchildren. So I will be a great grandfather. I can guarantee that because I, I'm going to get all the, all the, uh, all the good cooking and all the vegetables and all the, all the hunting and all that stuff. I, I, I can't wait for that to be my, my job, but, uh, yeah, 
how how do we deal with that? I think that that's a responsibility that as chefs we kind of need to take because I don't think anyone else will. Christian Puglisi, everyone, if you want to have people get in touch with you, is there a place that mm -hmm. you'd like people to go or, or especially with this, you know, if, if someone's listening, who's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a young talent. I, I need an investor. I need, I need an advisor for my company. Is yeah. that something that you're actively trying to pursue or, or, you know, maybe even any of yeah. your restaurants that are hiring right now that you'd like to point people towards? For sure. Well, we're hiring everywhere. <laughs> so uh, anybody out there that wants a job, just, uh, just, uh, just let me know, please. But it's easy to contact me through social media, uh, Instagram. Thank you again for coming on the show and and for your time. I'm I'm genuinely really excited you, to see this next chapter and and yeah, hope to hope to see you in person sometime. Thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it. Talk about an amazing conversation, Christian. I I knew he was a wealth of information, but just his ability to be straight, just give give it give it to you straight, is 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 one of the best parts about him. And I just I, I I'm so excited to see the folks that he partners up with and collaborates with over the next couple of decades in his career. And, you know, I know that at the end of that conversation, you got this little kind of pessimistic, you know, view of cooking as, as a career and as an industry. But I think that there's some, you know, heavy responsibility and ownership and like excitement. It's almost like I remember coming up in this industry in, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, and it was always this environment of like, oh, well, there, there's no jobs available. Like there's, there, there's, there's no opportunities. There's no chances. And I think the potential other way to look at it and the takeaway that I'm kind of processing after having this conversation with him is that maybe there's actually this wide open field now. Maybe it's not a, about hype and about, you know, who can do the most expensive this and who can do the flashiest that. I think there's actually a decrease in the amount of competition that you're having to potentially think of and barriers in your way. It's almost like if you want to do this, there's never almost been a better time to do this. And so maybe that's, you know, a little bit too much optimism from me. If you're listening at this point and you disagree or, you know, you'd like to lend your two cents, a really cool thing that I'm, you know, potentially wanting to, to drive forward is having you folks screenshot where you're at in the episode, tag me on Instagram and share your two cents in a little, you know, text field up above the the space and that will you know i know i'm not, not a lot of you folks are on twitter and so if you're listening and you want to kind of get involved in the conversation and share your thoughts that's a great way to do it another great place to do this is inside of the repertoire pro community which is where you can have expanded conversations outside of you know the comments section of other places on social media Friendly reminder that if you want to start taking your sleep a little bit more seriously, you can check out the Aura Ring. They just came out with their Generation 3. It's the best sleep tracker that I've used, and I wear it religiously almost every single day, and I use the insights to help make better decisions about my health. You can check that out on justincana.com slash Aura, O-U-R-A, or in the link in the description. You can also shop Corin for any of your Japanese tableware, knives, plateware, anything like that that you're interested in. And and, and again, I'll, I'll share the kind of geeking out gear stuff that I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, which is the Kaguya Wa Kingata Kyoto knife, which is linked in the description. Looks beautiful. It is incredibly hard. And it just looks like it's ready to start working, which I think is really, really nice. And then the second piece that I mentioned is the Silky S-I-L-K-Y kitchen scissors. Looks and works and operates way better than Joyce Chen's at the same price. And so, you know, say what you will about Joyce Chen's. This is my recommendation, and this is what I'm using. Until the next conversation with another, you know, just phenomenal piece of wisdom and insight, my name is Justin Kana. Please roll the outro. Well, well, here we are together again at the end of another episode of the Repertoire Podcast. If this is your first time listening, this is a show for hospitality creators who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have already learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Friendly heads up to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests, links to specifics that got brought up in this episode, as well as other helpful content that we create and share here 
online because everything we do is focused on helping you along your journey. If you don't have a ton of time, the best place to start is with some value sent straight to your inbox every single week. It's called the Repertoire Newsletter, where we share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. If you subscribe, we'll keep you up to date on trends that are shaping the hospitality creator ecosystem. We'll share discounts on gear that we find, as well as content that we've been producing ourselves and helpful articles that we've already read and decided are worth your time. Last up, if you want to connect with other industry professionals in the Repertoire Pro community, you want to check out courses like Total Station Domination or download free tools that we've created, you can learn more at joinrepertoire.com. That's J-O-I-N-R-E-P-E-R-T-O-I-R-E.com. The only ask from me is that if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate a review of this show on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. Regardless, I'll see you in the next episode. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.